All right, welcome to the uh, October 15th, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. We'll get started here in just a couple of moments. I'm going to do a quick audio test and make sure everything is coming through as expected. All right, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream. I'm based in, uh, I work as an employee for Yamaha Corporation of America, and I'm based in the United States, and I primarily focus on Steinberg products. And I'll be the host for the live stream. I'm, going, I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C., <clears throat> excuse me, area in Alexandria, Virginia. And if for those people who are watching it live, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us uh, where you're from, there's always a uh, uh, it's always enjoyable for me and others to see people from all over the world on the live stream. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can submit questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de, or you could simply enter your questions in the chat field. When entering questions in the chat field, uh, make sure that if you could give information such as which operating system you're running, or it's Mac or PC, if you are, uh, which version of Cubase uh, and which level of Cubase, you can say I'm running Cubase 10.5 Elements on Mac, Big Sur, I'm running Cubase 11 Pro on Windows 10. Uh, that information is helpful. Sometimes my ability to answer questions in a real-time manner um, won't be possible during the live stream format. I'll try to get through as many of the questions as completely and succinctly and in order that uh, I receive them. So we'll try to go through those. So if, if you don't get an immediate response to your question, if we could try to avoid uh, asking the same question repeatedly, that would be appreciated. Just kind of slows down the whole process. A uh, few people um, that I want to uh, give special thanks to, if you want to, we will probably later tonight have all of the topics covered in today's live stream pinned at the top of the comments field with timestamps so you could immediately read the question and go to that part of the live stream but if you wanted to search for different uh live streams or topics that may have been covered in previous live streams you could do that at uh cubaseindex.com and Jan from stockholm is kind enough to do that we have uh, another wonderful resource of Cubase and Steinberg information is going to be uh, the Cubase Nation Discord. And Jazz Dude does a lot of work uh, on that to compile a lot of great information. So kudos to him. And we have two people that serve as moderators uh, that can <clears throat> answer questions uh, before I get to it if necessary and do a lot of work and they kind of volunteered to do this as so Agent K and Jazz Dude. So just a quick uh, shout out to them. Uh, during the live stream, you know, uh, I may get interrupted. You may hear my wife working directly above me. Uh, my son may be home like the last half hour of the live stream from school. So I may, he may want to interrupt and just tell me something about his day. I'll try to keep all interruptions to a minimum so we can get through as many questions as possible. And with that, I'll kind of break out my chat and we will get started. Okay, so I just see question. Uh, when loading a recent project, Cubase is asking for all kinds of plugins and audio folders used in legacy projects. Uh, what is your recommendation to organize the project and audio folders best? So uh, it sounds like maybe there's, uh, you know, files being referenced in a particular project. So one way, uh, one way to kind of do this is there's, there's a couple of approaches. Uh, sometimes people will build a project and, you know, maybe just choose to delete all the audio files in a project and then build a project on there. And those audio files that were associated with the project can still be referenced in the audio pool. So if we go to the media and go to open pool window, what we could do is come right over here and you'll see a function by right clicking where you could say, first off is to remove unused media. So if you do that, that should 
uh, get rid of missing files messages and with missing files that may also be to include plugins that are not on a particular uh, folder. So as we're kind of working with projects, you know, another method. Um, so when you start a new project, it's always a good idea to have each project and with Cubase 11, this kind of behavior uh, change where it'll, it'll prompt for project location. So when you start a project, you'll say create empty and then you choose a folder uh, right at that point and all the files will go into the folder that you've defined. Now it's really easy when you do a new project to maybe um, just kind of blow through this and not create a unique folder for each project. So if you have gotten to that stage and maybe multiple uh, projects are sharing in the same audio folder, one of the methods to kind of clean that up is just to go to your file menu and go to back up project. Once you do this, it's gonna ask you to create a new folder that's kind of has no files in it, so just a new folder with nothing in it, and then it will back up all of the files needed for that particular project and not the files that aren't being used in that project to the folder you just defined in that step. Okay, so you have a question. Uh, I get no sound from the metronome set to Steinberg click sound. Uh, can you please talk through the metronome setup and features briefly? All right, so a lot of times when we're just kind of playing, if we have the C key, we could hear the metronome come through here. So many times when we do this, you can go into uh, like audio connections if you have, depending on your version of Cubase, but you could also um, go to the metronome setup. And once you have the metronome setup, you'll see click sounds. And at this point, um, I'll just turn this off, sorry, it's very annoying. So let's come over here to uh, so the metronome setup. And once you have your audio click outputs, you could choose what output the click track is being routed to and make sure that you have the use audio click turned on. Often when I kind of get this message where it seems like, you know, I have the metronome turned on here, it could be as if you're using the control room that you might just have to activate the metronome in the control room. So if, if the metronome isn't turned on in the control room, try making sure that we see this little icon here just to the left of the main volume monitoring volume knob and the one on the bottom and that will could turn off the metronome uh, and bypass it in the control room as well. So I think if you probably do one of those uh, things, you'll get your click sound back. Okay, uh, so we have a question. How can I create a guitar strum from a chord where all notes play at the same time initially when played with a keyboard using a classical guitar plugin? All right, so let's say if we wanted to take um, and create kind of like a strum type of, of edit here. So as we work and I wanted to basically, it sounds like maybe that they want the beginnings to be slightly staggered. So it sounds more like a strum. So if we go to this tool here, we have a trim tool and hold down the alt or option key. Then you could just kind of choose to do like little strums kind of like that very easily. So that's a very kind of effective way to kind of just take something and create kind of, you know, guitar strum. So again, the, Try going to the trim tool. Uh, and a lot of times if you wanted to trim the end, you could just use it by default. But when you hold down the alt or option key, at that point, it will be very useful for doing kind of guitar strum types of editing for MIDI data. All right, so we see Captenergy Music from Pennsylvania on the live stream and Matt Elliston from London. All right, we have Uno from Finland, and we have Jan from Stockholm. All 
All right, so I just see uh, it's a question. Uh, hey, Greg, when I use the delete all controller data function, it does not delete the program change data. How can I automate it uh, so it'll also get deleted? So let's go ahead and take a look. I'll just draw in some modulation data here on this particular part. And let's say if I have uh, control, let's say if I have program changes, going on all right so now if i wanted to come here we could just say under functions um delete continuous controllers all right and let's say if i come over here to my modulation, we will undo that. So my modulation will be deleted. So I think technically in the MIDI specification that, uh, you know, program changes might not be a continuous controller, uh, even though it's kind of handled very similarly, but if you want it to create uh, a logical editor preset, so let's say if I have modulation data and um, program changes, so let's say I have both of these. All right, so I'll just, now that I have both those open, I'm just gonna test it one more time under delete uh, continuous controllers. All right, so, but if you wanted to create a logical editor preset, we could say delete, um, and we'll say type is equal to program change. And we could also say type is, equal to kind of like uh, pitch bend isn't necessarily a program chain, like a continuous controller, but it's a MIDI system common message. So let's say type is equal to controller. So if I have this set up, I could now come over here and let's just choose Just try one. So let's say if I just wanted to delete program change. And let's say we'll undo that. And let's say. We may have to specify uh, which controller the value one is. So we'll say is equal to controller one. So at this point, uh, maybe it's just something with my Boolean condition, but so program change isn't technically a continuous controller, but just come over here and you can make a logical editor preset to get rid of program changes that have been written in. All right, so we see John Costigan checking in from Kenosha, Wisconsin. All right, so just see, uh, it just, just says another question. How can I select the parts data in a track with a logical editor? It only selects on the left lane. Um, so let's say I wanted to come here and select um, so I'm not sure when you say it only selects on the left lane. So let's say if I wanted to select um, I'm just going to reread this quick. Okay, so when you say it only selects the left lane, so if I want it to come here, if it's a MIDI logical editor, I'm not sure if it's a MIDI logical editor or logical editor preset. 
but I could just say we'll select um, all notes and I could, you know, select all notes and controllers. So, you know, at that point we could, you know, select. So if you could, um, so I'm not sure if you wanted to select events kind of on like parts on the project window. So let's say if I wanted to, you know, select parts, you know, we could do this with the project logical editor. So I could say, okay, um, so here we'll choose to select um, container type is equal to track. And then we could say the name um, contains So if I come here, there I could select kind of the track names with pianos. But if we say uh, container type is equal to event, and then that contains the word piano. So let's say if I'm here, um, So at that point, I could uh, just select, you know, particular events. Um, so anytime that I wanted to come over here and, you know, so you could do it based on events. So if I just say, let's select events. And we could say, I want to select uh, events. The media type is equal to MIDI. Or instrument so you could do it kind of like that so let me know if that's what you want to do or if it's in the editor okay great to see michael pierce on the live stream and taylor sap from pine grove So I just see a question um, So uh, about Taylor, uh, Jazz Dude was mentioning about you could send an email. So it says, uh, maybe I've misunderstood, but wouldn't my email address be shown as a sender when I send an email to Club Cubase? It kind of works in a, an odd way because I'm not a Steinberg employee. So they created an email address that it gets forwarded to. So sometimes uh, I get the email forwarded from the club cubase at steinberg.de and it's not coming directly to my email box. So if you include your email address, that, that's always helpful. All right, so we have Jake from Colorado and Jeweled Lotus from Maryland, so not far from me probably. All right, so we just see, uh, hi Greg, uh, hope you're fine and family. I have a question, please. Does the Steinberg line of interface get noisy preamps and a lot of noise signal on outputs, as everybody says, what is the problem? So I think, you know, if you listen to it, it they're not noisy preamps and may have, um, like sometimes some of our interfaces, especially with the Rupert Neve Designs Transformers, some people look at the signal to noise ratio and think it's a bad sounding interface, but you know, it's, that's part of, what makes it sound so good is a Rupert Neve Transformer on like on specs may not look so spectacular, but it sounds wonderful. So I think that you'll find that the preamps are very quiet and not noisy. So and it could be just kind of a misinterpretation of specs.
All right, so we have David Griffiths checking in from Wales in the UK. All right, so you see, uh, hi, I'm new here. How can I remove vocals? Um, let me just see, I, my chat field just kind of jumped. Uh, like how to remove vocals from Cubase uh, AI LE 11. So, you know, that version doesn't come with uh, a particular tool. So if you have, I think Cubase Artist and Pro will come with uh, Spectral Layers 1. Uh, so we'll show you that real quick. Um, but it's not a function that's going to be included with the uh, LE or AI um, versions of Cubase. So let me just but we can show you how it works. Um, and if you wanted to upgrade, you could, you know, definitely kind of take advantage of that. Let me see if I have the particular project open here. If I'll just open it. So you could also get a trial version of Spectral Layers, which is also a Steinberg product. Um, so we'll just come over here. So let's say we're listening to. That if you feel the urge to see me. So I could take that and we'll go to audio to extensions and go to Spectral Layers. And if we just come over here to layers, we could choose to unmix stems. So Spectral Layers 1 could unmix the vocals from the backing track. And the full version of Spectral Layers Pro can do, um, you know, kind of take the drums and the bass, uh, guitars and vocals and separate them. So now if I wanted to come, uh, we could play back this file. Well, you best pretend you're blind. I don't mean to be unkind, but all the reasons I let And I can take the vocals behind. here. I just have to remember. I don't care about you anyway. Or mute the vocals. Take it off the loop. Sorry about that. It's actually annoying. Hey, no, no, no. I don't care about you when I say it to your face. If I knew you could take it. So if you get a more advanced version of Cubase, you get the Spectral Layers 1. You could also, if you needed to do it like in a pinch, there is a trial version of Spectral Layers that you could use. Um, and that is a wonderful tool for doing uh, spectral layer for doing like vocal removal. All right, so we see Cedric from India checking in. Glad you could join us for the live stream. Um, so I see, uh, by removing unused media, can you undo that? So I think if you don't, uh, save the project that it won't be saved without the media. So, um, but let's go ahead and try it really quick. So let's say I'll just come here and we'll record just a blank audio file. Okay, I'm going to erase it. We'll go into our pool window. So let's say if I remove unused media so let's so 
sorry, open the wrong window. So let's come over here and we'll just say pool window. So let's say I remove this track. So it's just kind of places it into the trash folder and then you could move the audio file back. But let's say if I um, had that in my project here and we will just do a quick uh, remove unused media. So let's say remove from the pool, we could place it in the trash. And let's see if we, so it's not necessarily like an, an edit that could be undone, but once it's in the trash, you could just move it back into your audio folder. So. All right, so we see Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. Glad you could join us. And we see Michael Pierce saying, I swear, I sometimes get to Cubase click in my dreams. Yeah, so it's made, it's kind of made its way into a lot of dance tracks over the years. You know, I remember being in Germany once and just hearing on the radio just a song with the Cubase click track that was rendered that probably someone left on while they did the final mix down. All right, so we see Millard Brown on the live stream with Sergio Casimir also joining. And I see he has lots of questions today. And Sable Winters is on the live stream. All right, we have Chris checking in from Poland. All right, and we have Termo Nuclear War from Serbia. And Jeff Zabelski from Chico, California. Okay, um, so I just see a question. Uh, I recently made it possible along with the recording button to turn on the monitoring button. Uh, now I can't find out how to do it back. So it's probably just a preference. So let's say if I add an audio track here, um, that when we're in record, we may want the monitor to automatically kick in. So it's probably going to be found under preferences. And if we go to uh, VST, you'll see auto monitoring style. So you could choose that uh, as being manual or being while record enabled, uh, while record running or tape machine style. So probably if you just switch that back to manual, then you'll go back to the default state that it was before. So once again, preferences to VST, auto monitoring style, and then you could set the preference there of how you want the monitoring to be engaged. All right, so I just see a comment um, just says, what I find really annoying is when you click at the top of the play from here line, it sometimes zooms into the project. So as you click and holding, you have to zoom back in or out. So, you know, one way to do that, if you have, uh, a, you know, to avoid, you know, some people think that you have to go to the particular project, you know, to go up here to navigate in the timeline. So let's say while we're playing, let me activate this project and we'll show you a trick. Um, so if you're going up there just to kind of navigate to different playhead positions, like people will come here, okay, I wanna jump here and maybe they accidentally zoomed. Really all you have to do is anywhere that you click, I think it's you hold down Alt and Shift, you can now just move the playhead. So Alter Option plus Shift and click anywhere on the project. And that way you don't have to go up here constantly to do it. And it won't like select the event with those modifier keys. So you could just kind of click Alt 
plus shift while holding down the shift key and click in the project and the playhead will go there. So hopefully that'll be less annoying. All right. So we have Antonian Antonin uh, from Prague. Thanks for joining us. Um, so you just see, I doubt uh, if I'm the first person to ask this, but um, let me find a question just jumped on me. Um, uh, I'm thinking of updating to Windows 11. Is it too early to know how Cubase 11 will run on it? So the official statement from Steinberg is they're still doing all the quality assurance tests. There are many users that are running Cubase uh, 11 on Windows 11 uh, without any problems, but as they're kind of going through new operating systems, you know, there's thousands of different things that they test, uh, and they're still in the middle of those tests because sometimes, you know, the version that hits is, you know, changing until it's actually released. So now that it's in the wild, the tests are going on. So maybe other people could uh, comment if they're running it on Windows 11. Most people haven't had a major issue with it, but the official line from Steinberg is they're still uh, investigating, so. All right, great to see Marcos Gomez on the live stream. All right, and we have Chris checking in from Wheaton, Illinois. And Soren from Sweden. We see a question, uh, can Spectralayers 1 be used for noise reduction? So it doesn't have um, specific noise reduction features, but you could, uh, you know, take out different functions. So if you want it to, let's say, you know, go to the audio, and let's say we go to extensions and we go to our spectral layers here. So if you find that you do have like a noisy audio file part, you know, you could select the frequencies and be able to delete those. Uh, the spectral layers element and spectral layers pro will allow you to um, select kind of a region of the audio. And if we go to process, you know, here we could just go to, um, so if we come right over here, we could say noise reduction, and then you could actually register the noise and do noise reduction there. And that's a function that isn't in, uh, the spectral layers one. So you could do kind of frequency based editing in spectral layers one or, and the like vocal removal, but the uh, the more uh, the other more advanced versions of spectral layers will have specific noise reduction. All right, so we just see uh, Greg. Did you know when Cubase will be? fully adopted for windows and high DPI mode. So many graphic bugs and issues, you know, it's, you know, there's, there's great support in Cubase for it. There's a lot of, you know, different, you know, many times it's third party plugins that aren't high DPI compatible that people use in Cubase and think it's a Cubase issue, but it's the plugin that's not high DPI. Um, and you know, there are different scaling issues, but you know, pretty much the application works great in high DPI mode. Uh, you know, and with version 10, you know, like tens of thousands of windows were completely rewritten and redesigned for high DPI scaling. Uh, so, you know, I think, and there's a lot of high DPI issues with different video card drivers uh, that's kind of outside of Cubase's um, capabilities to address. So, but I think most people are running it without, uh, any issues in high DPI and realizing that a lot of third-party components may not uh, be high DPI compatible. So 
So you see uh, from Michael Pierce, uh, at work my main screen is at the far end of a desk and my eyesight's, well, not the best. I, I'm right there with you, Michael Pierce. Uh, would be handy as a 5K screen at three meters is quite hard to read. Uh, new eyes, please. So yeah, we'll try to get you a new prescriptions but you know you can have different scaling types so you know even i think you're running on mac michael if i'm not mistaken but even if you go to the display and maybe just try to you know have it set for scaled resolution that you might find it a little better so you know like i find a 1080p resolution very comfortable to work at and i don't i have horrible eyes myself um so if you could get like kind of a 1080p resolution, I think that's a good, uh, good size to work with instead of, you know, like having it be, uh, you know, four times this resolution, but to have a 1080p with, you know, four times the, the, uh, you know, kind of the crispness in, at that particular resolution. So experiment with some different scaling options. Uh, and that could also be dependent upon your display monitor as well. Okay, so we have a question. How do you mute some events on a track? So let's say if I just wanted to come here, so let's say I have multiple events, there is a mute tool. So you could actually just kind of come right here and just click on it with the X tool. And that will be your mute tool. And then you could mute and unmute events on the track. And that way they could be independent of you know, you can mute the events as well. You know, if, if if you wanted some parts to be muted and not without having to mute the track. So just click on it with the X tool and then you can mute and unmute just like so. So when it's white like that, that's indicating that it's muted. Okay, so I uh, just see in the media, I choose banks of patterns for the groove agent. There are, are examples of suitable sounds with rhythmic chords. Uh, I choose the pattern I like, drag it to the working section, but the groove agent itself does not display the rhythmic patterns. It's empty. Uh, but the example of the rhythm, I liked sounds, uh, but I don't understand how to work with this. So let's go back to another project here. Okay, so I'm not sure if you're uh, doing it from within Groove Agent, you know, so let's say if I'm here uh, and I have just just jump to a more reasonable pattern here, tempo. So I'll just, let's say I'll load this kit with patterns. Okay, so let's say, okay. Okay, so if you're doing, let's say if I'm auditioning patterns here, like, you know, I go to the media. Um, so let's say, okay, I'm looking for uh, more like a hip hop pattern. You know, I could now come over here and so, you know, here we could do different kits. So let's say, okay, I go back to my urban ballads kit. And then if I wanted to go to styles, you know, I could say, okay, <clears throat> these would be like the patterns. So if I wanted to just, you know, take that style over, some of these may not make sense, but you know, what you could probably do, and if you're dragging it to the agent here, you might 
just have to actually, you know, drag it into the kit first, you know, to load it into the instrument and then drag the instrument, drag it from the instrument over. So, so if you're dragging the pattern from here to the project window, it probably makes sense that this is gonna be kind of associated with this. So try dragging this into uh, the patterns area of the kit and then you know make sure that it's kind of sounding as you want and then carry that over uh, and drag that into your project window. All right, so I just see uh, from Soren just saying, Greg, does the patterns in this drum kit malfunction for you to beat agent, uh, rock pop toolbox, Virginia Beach kit? So let me just. Okay, let's just see if I could. Yeah, it seems like that's not kind of working as expected. So let me see if I come over here to, to the instrument here. Yeah, so it seems like that's kind of misbehaving on my end, but if I drag it to the, uh, drag it directly to the time, if I drag it directly into the time, but it doesn't seem like that is kind of functioning for me. So if that's what's happening to you, I could confirm and I'll, I'll make sure to pass that on. Okay, we see Jazz Dude wants people to smash the like button. So if you have learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. That enables us to continue to do these live streams. Okay, so we see um, we see Ian from the UK joining us. Uh, we see a question from Jeff Zabelski. Um, I was confused. Trans Loop of Colors and Spectralers Pro has uh, great noise reduction tools and menus to sample a section of noise or hum reduce. Um, okay, so I guess it, Jeff is just kind of passing on a comment. Uh, so we see, uh, hey Greg, in the key commands window, is it possible to show only the user defined one? So I think it's gonna be global for all the key commands. So I don't know of a way to uh, indicate, um, yeah, I think it's gonna be all the key commands that are available in the product, in the prod, in the program, as opposed to just user generated uh, key commands. So I don't know of a way to select those. Um, sorry about that. Okay. 
Okay, so we have a question from Desmond. Um, should I render all MIDI tracks to audio from my production, then start a new project for mixing? If so, how? So the only time you really need to render, uh, you know, MIDI tracks is if you're running out of CPU cycles. So there's no need, to, you know, if you're, sometimes people will render the MIDI tracks if they are planning to pass it on to someone else and they know that they're not gonna have the instrument and, you know, and their job is to deliver the audio files. Um, and there's a number of ways you could do that. You could, you know, select all of the events <clears throat> and you know do a you could do a render in place for multiple events you, you could do that so if i have like this one selected i could just render in place or if you do an export audio mix down you could create stems here but unless you're running out of CPU resources um that you do not you know there's kind of a misconception that oh you have to turn all of your, your MIDI into virtual instruments. And you really only need to do that if you're actually need to deliver stems to someone else or if you're running out of CPU cycle. So you could just mix directly from right within that particular project. Uh, and you know, that way, if you need to, you know, tweak one MIDI note at the very end of a mix stage, you know, okay, that, you know, like, instead of doing a complicated mix where it's like, okay, if I just take this velocity down on this low end by five velocity values, it'll fix everything in a mix that you could often have that flexibility of working in the MIDI domain until the very end. All right, so we have Nick checking in from the UK. All right, so it's just seeing this, uh, this question was kind of asked in the last live stream. Um, is there going to be a fix with the stock EQ? Every time I grab a point, the mouse doesn't hang on to it. Uh, it's happening to a friend of mine as well, Cubase uh, 11.5 Pro on Intel i9. So I assume it's uh, Cubase 10.5, but I haven't had any problems. So if I could just kind of grab the stock EQ uh, and, you know, it'll just you know, if I keep the mouse held down, it will just keep, you know, allowing me to adjust accordingly. And if I hold down different modifier keys, I could restrict like the frequency when I hold down control or command, or I could restrict the gain, the amount of gain by holding down alter option or shift. I can come over here uh, and, and just like freeze the cue but I don't have any problems at all and you know, of, you know, we've, uh, of running into where the mouse is letting go. So as long as I hold the mouse down, everything is kind of working here as expected. Um, so if you could let me know what mouse you have, sometimes some mice can be like really sensitive. Um, and tend not to work well with a lot of programs like Apple's magic mouse is a, a mouse that, you know, tends to be like super sensitive and can sometimes cause problems in, in many programs, including Cubase. Um, so I find if you're doing with a magic mouse, if you got a $10 Logitech that, you know, everyone's problems with mouse stuff goes away on multiple programs. Um, so if that's the case, but I have not run into any issues with the EQ, um, uh, you know, working, you know, grabbing it. So if you could let us know, Matt, that'd be great. All right, so we have uh, Johnny Ray checking in from the Bay Area. Thanks for joining, being a part of the community. All 
All right, so we just see a uh, question. I can't get my keyboard to output and sound. Um, so is it a MIDI keyboard? Is it a MIDI controller? Is it the computer keyboard? Um, you know, so when you're working with this, if it's a MIDI keyboard, which I'll, I'll assume, you know, make sure that A, that you have MIDI communication. So if it's gonna be functioning as a controller, first establish if you have MIDI communication. So if we look into, lower right hand corner of the transport when I hit my MIDI controller um, you'll see like MIDI activity here so so first establish if it's a like a keyboard like a MIDI keyboard controller that you have MIDI communication here um, if you are you know wanting to play like an instrument you can now make sure that the instrument is loaded here and that it's either monitored or record enabled. Then that will pass the MIDI information directly to that instrument. Um, if you have MIDI communication and if it's playing to the instrument, but maybe it's a keyboard that has its own sounds, something like a Yamaha Montage, something along those lines, what you could do is just make sure that you have the correct MIDI inputs and outputs, and you may have to have the USB driver for the device installed, and then that would allow you to send the MIDI information to that device, uh, and that device will generate the tones. So that's why often you hear uh, synthesizers and rack mount modules re referred to as tone generators because the MIDI information is then sent out and the audio is sent to the device and you could verify that you're hearing the sound after you record something and play it back through like plugging in headphones or connecting that into a mixer. Uh, so if it's an external tone generator keyboard, uh, you know, you would need to have the audio routed to it. So if you don't have a mixer, you could go into the audio connections and come over here and define an external instrument and connect it into two inputs of your audio interface. And then you could add, uh, as you go to add an instrument track, we could route this to your external instruments and you could say, okay, I want this to go to my montage and at this point, we could take this and be able to run the audio outs uh, through your Cubase EQs and your software plugin effects as well. So if you could let us know, um, you know, like what type of keyboard you have, this from uh, UFO. Okay, so we have uh, from 339 Lenny, uh, when adding plugins to vocal, is it better to do it on each audio track or in a group track uh, where multiple audio tracks are routed? Uh, thanks again for your work. So it can really depend on, you know, if you want to, you know, edit something collectively or process something collectively rather. So let's say if I wanted to come to this project You know, you could do it either way, um, but a lot of times, it, you know, you may have reverbs be kind of individual, but let's say if I'm on this and I have a lot of background vocals, So if I wanted to, you know, you, you could process all these individually and that's totally fine, but you could also say, okay, I want it to a very common trick where you get those kind of smooth, silky uh, background vocals on you know, classic records and is, you know, they will uh, add a group channel to the selected tracks and we'll make it like a stereo group because these will be panned and on a group track, So let's say we'll just rewind a little bit here. And at this point I could just put a compressor. So now if we wanted to listen to that kind of in context.
So, you know, you could compress. Um, you know, it's really just kind of a personal taste, you know. So a lot of times if you're, you know, running the same reverb on the lead vocal as you are for like background vocals in a group, you know, you, you sharing the same reverb send isn't going to take, uh, you know, additional CPU. Uh, so once you have that reverb active, it's, you know, you could use it anywhere in the project. But, you know, often people would do group processing on dynamics or EQ to kind of make it like a single, you know, to take multiple elements and kind of make it sound a bit more cohesive. So that's a, that's a, a typical way of working, so. All right, so I just see uh, why the split screen um, new layout makes me crazy. So if it's kind of with the, uh, you know, if you want, you know, if it's with, you know, having like your MIDI data, you know, here, you know, if you don't want the split screen, um, you know, you could turn that off and kind of work exactly as you were before and come over here to the preferences and go to editors and you can say, you, you know, double click opens uh, the editor in a window as opposed to the lower zone. And now every time that you do this, you could have the same exact workflow uh, as you did in previous versions. So if that's a split screen that you're talking about, you don't have to have that. You could turn it on and a lot of people find it convenient, so. Um, so we have a question from Michael Pierce. I was wondering if the ruler could be uh, rescaled vertically, uh, if we could request that as a feature. So I think it's gonna be kind of a fixed size uh, and I've kind of passed that along as well. So let's go ahead and just check. So say we could go to bars and beats here. So yeah, that's a fixed size for the ruler track. So I think that you know could make sense for it to be um, yeah, maybe a little larger, I could see that, but I think there's also kind of the intention of that a lot of times, you know, not to have that be such a take up so much real estate in a busy project. Um, but I'll pass that along as a feature request, Michael. Okay, so we see Charles K from UK. Thanks for joining and being a part of the community. Okay, so I think this uh, more with the uh, controller or the MIDI keyboard sound not working. It says, uh, I'm still using Cubase LE uh, 9 with Windows 10. It was working, settings got messed up. I use the Lexicon with my Cubase. So, it, you know, make sure if it's, you know, if you're playing the virtual instruments, make sure that you go to the studio setup here. Uh, and when you go to the audio system that you have the Lexicon uh, selected as your audio driver and that once you have that set that if we go into uh, the studio menu to audio connections that on outputs that you you know have your outputs here being sent to your lexicon um, so you could you could try that UFO Seeing some discussion on, we see Jeff Sabelski has a 32 inch monitor, which is, seems to like. All 
All right, uh, so just see, can I set a shortcut to transpose a clip up or down one semitone? So if you wanted to do it, um, you know, let's see if we come here. I'm not sure if we could do like the info line. Let's take a quick look just to make sure I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure if it's for audio or or for MIDI data. Yeah, so um, what you could do, if it's gonna be for audio, we could just come over here. Somebody wants to so let's say we'll take that and let's get audio to processes. Um, and then I think we could do um, pitch shift. So let's say if we call this up. Okay, so if I just wanted to transpose down, um, so at this point, I think if we, um, so you know, you could do it kind of through an offline process. Um, and I think if we just say, you know, pull up the keyboard shortcut for audio to transpose, that it would still do the same amount, but it might be, you might get the same exact, the, the previously used function. But if you wanted to go, you know, back and forth kind of easily between it, you know, so it may not be a keyboard shortcut, but I think it's, you know, if I come here and just from the info line, you know, just select your transpose. So you can say, I can go up major third, let's go down. Smooth it out when things get rough. Keep your and just be able to kind of do up. this. So I know it's not necessarily a keyboard shortcut, but it's still pretty fast to do. Um, and you could set up on the MIDI side, if it's going to be for MIDI, you could set up, you know, logical editor presets. So if you selected uh, a MIDI part, you know, you could say, I want to take the MIDI notes and value one. I could subtract by one or or add by one or subtract by one and save those as presets and at that point uh, set up key commands for those particular functions. Okay, so we see, uh, can you explain the function of setting the project key and global transpose? So project key could be used primarily with like some of the content that will like MIDI loops. So if you go to like some of the SQL contents, you could uh, come over here and these would have like keys as part of the different data. So your MIDI data could switch from major to minor. And then when we do, kind of global transpose, you know, what that is gonna be set for is that you could have a transpose track. So while I'm playing, so let's say while I'm, I can right click and we'll add a transpose track. And what we could do is kind of take the entire song while it's playing. So while I'm here, we could just say, okay. And we could just transpose. And we'll transpose again. 
So we could have, like, maybe I don't want the drum loops or the drum parts to actually follow. So I could select the drum events here and we could have it not follow the global transpose. So at that point, like maybe you don't want the drums to transpose and play different MIDI notes if there are MIDI drums. Uh, so you could tell tracks to follow the transposition of the transpose track or not to, so. Right, reading through. Uh, okay, reading through comments. All right, so we have a question uh, from Michael Pierce. Uh, I have a session coming in from a Pro Tools user uh, or, uh, who's gonna export me a MIDI tempo track. Not done this in years, but is it relatively simple to import tempo data from a MIDI file? So just the MIDI file itself to do it. But uh, one thing to be, uh, can, one thing to check, Michael, is if you go to preferences, usually by default Cubase for some reason will ignore the mass will ignore tempo information so let's say if we go to midi files um, make sure that you have if you go to preferences to midi to midi file just make sure that you have uh, ignore master tracks on merge unchecked and then when you go to import the midi file the tempo information will just automatically be carried directly over so if you have that, then it's a piece of cake. So I see uh, kind of further clarification with the uh, the mouse problem. So, so saying, yes, it is an Apple magic mouse that, you know, try just getting any other mouse and see if you have the same exact problems with it. So, and if you look, there's lots of issues with the Apple magic mouse that, uh, you know, across many numerous programs. All right, so just see, uh, I work a lot with vocals and stems. I use Cubase for MIDI and Reaper for mixing and mastering. Adding effects in Cubase makes it crash a lot. So, you know, uh, check to make sure, A, that you're not using any 32-bit plugins. If you're running 32-bit plugins, you know, they will generally cause a lot of system instability. So, but I think, um, you know, you should be able to run your Cubase without crashing, uh, you know, if. Uh, just doing audio plugins, so. I think that you'll find Cubase is gonna be the best for MIDI and audio, so. All right, uh, so we see Greg, uh, question. Is it possible to make the effect send on a track the processing sounds only in certain places? This applies to both audio tracks and MIDI. So, you know, there's a couple ways you could do this. Let's say I wanted to come and we'll just listen to it all began. so say i just wanted to have maybe my delay so you know you could automate this send as kind of one one method of doing this so let's say okay i wanted to come here so i will just click on um so we'll automate this end here. Right, 
touch my hand And it's got it's some got magic to do so let's say if I want to now play that back, we could just come here. And now you'll see the send automation. So you could automate the sends. Another thing you could do is just kind of come over here, select the region. So let's say even if I wanted to have that same uh, effect, I could just come right over here. Let's get to audio to direct offline processing. So I'm going to just select a little region here and just say, okay, I wanted to add a plugin and I want this to be um, a mono delay. Let's make it a dotted quarter. So now, and we could choose to have this add a tail if we wanted to. So now this will just, so we see the automation go down and now this will be. So at that point we could just embed the, and process the plugin um, directly on a particular section. So you say, you know, I wanted this to be um, reversed and I wanted to have, you know, a reverb on that particular section. So, you know, in this way, it, this won't take any additional CPU cycles, but it will just allow you to kind of come over here and just say. So you could do like different processing like that and you could always change these parameters or undo them and go right back to where you were originally with the file. So you could do like send automation or you could do automation or just select a region and do processing and this you could add the tail size to it or you know in milliseconds or you could extend the processing range so if you wanted the delay to go beyond the selection to make it sound natural so it doesn't cut off you, so there's a couple ways of doing that All right, so we just see uh, it is an option to buy a soft tube controller. So yeah, lots of people use the soft tube controllers with Cubase. Um, so I just see from Matt Elder, uh, it is an Apple Magic Mouse. Uh, is there one you could recommend? Not a cheapo. So you know. I've always had great luck with uh, the Logitech mice, the Microsoft mice. I've never had any issues with any of those. So. You see Michael Pierce is recommending the Logitech Master MX mouse. Thanks for that, Michael. Okay, so we see, uh, is it better to buy an interface with insert slots? Um, you know, a lot of times I, I have uh, my, my MR816s have an insert slot um, and I, I do have a compressor that I could use, a hardware compressor that I could patch in if needed, um, but I haven't really done that in a long time. So, you know, if you have, the, you know, I would say, you know, if you have, you know, many people would use the inserts for like EQ and compression. So if you have a piece of outboard uh, hardware that's like an EQ compressor, like an API or Neve or something like that, then you could benefit from having inserts if you wanted to have that flavor. Um, but, you know, a lot of interfaces don't have inserts. Um, so unless you have a specific piece of outboard gear that you want to integrate via an insert, 
Some people would also use it, um, use the inserts to bypass the mic preamp uh, in an interface. So if you have like, you know, a really high end one channel mic preamp, you could go in via the insert and kind of get a, and bypass the uh, in and bypass the mic pre's of an interface. So it's not as common. So, but I would say if you have like, you know, favorite, like every time I do vocal, it's going through this compressor and this EQ, then, you know, an interface with inserts is preferable. I would tend to think that most of them are pretty underutilized because people will kind of plug in directly and then use processing in as plugins. That's very typical. So, but, you know, depending on if you have that, you know, so if you don't have that and it's something that you're going to be getting into relatively soon, you could just simply, you know, go for it. But if many, many interfaces don't have inserts, probably because they're not being asked for by the market. Okay, so I just see, uh, is there an automated way Cubase can find downbeats and automatically shift the event track to the nearest bar? Thanks. Um, all right, so let's say if I'll just do. So you could, you know, Cubase could kind of work both ways. So you could have the bars automatically fit the downbeats, but let's say um, like I wanted to take this loop here and let's say if we listen to it, uh, so it'd be relatively in time, but let's say. So if I activate kind of audio warp quantizing here, um, at this point, we could say, okay, my quantized value, I want it to be set to eighth notes. Uh, and then we could choose to quantize. And if we watch, when I hit quantize, you'll see some of the different elements will shift here. So let me just... So I'll hit quantize. And let's say I'll just do two, maybe quarter notes. So you can see some of the events will automatically shift. Um, you could also just kind of come in here to hit points, you know, and if you, once we kind of have the hit points defined, so let's say we'll come here, say, okay, I want those. We could just kind of create warp markers. And at that point you could physically move the elements, but you know, if I say, okay, let's just make this all, um, you know, quantized to quarter notes, we could just come right over here and then just shift the difference. Let's say I want this to be uh, eighth note triplets, quantize, and then you could quantize and that will move kind of the hit points uh, and that can quantize the audio to match the grid. So we just see, uh, looks like we have to be a computer engineer to use this. So, you know, we have lots of people that are blind that run Cubase all the time. So, it, you know, Cubase does a tremendous amount of information uh, and has a tremendous amount of capabilities, but you don't always have to use that, so. Okay, uh, so we see, hi, uh, can you explain how to use gain staging, please? I use Easy Drummer, uh, 
and it's really hard to mix the hi-hat. It's so loud. So a lot of times, what you know, it may not be like a gain structure feature. So let's say if I'm here um, and I have, let's say, our, a pattern. Okay, and so let's say we have this pattern playing all the time. So a lot of times within, um, so we'll just reread this. Um, okay, so if your hi-hat is loud, you, you could probably come over here into the instrument itself. Like I don't have, um, I don't have Easy Drummer here, but if I want to take the hi-hat, I'm sure Easy Drummer has something similar, but you could come over here and just adjust kind of the volume of each of the different sounds. So, you know, if I just wanted to come here, you know, we could select the hi-hat or the different elements. So let's say, you know, if I wanted to come here and just adjust you know, even, you know, or you may have like a mixer. So you can say, okay, I want the hi-hat or the snare. You know, so you could adjust kind of the gain structure within the actual um, program itself. Now, a lot of times what you do, I think Easy Drummer, you could drag the patterns out. And like, if you're having problems with the hi-hats, you know, often what you want to do is to just adjust the velocity of the hi-hats and that could make it sit a lot better in a mix. Sometimes people will give you kind of like, uh, it's very popular to kind of use pre-done patterns and those patterns may be suitable for someone else's taste. But you know, if you have the MIDI data in the project, you know, and this is obviously a strength of Cubase being able to, you know, take your snare and you know, make it louder and have it kind of fit. So, you know, let's say if I even wanted to take, you know, just something simple. Like, let me just make this into a quick one measure pattern, you know. So let's say, okay, I put in like a kick. All right, and let's say I just want to put in hi hats here. So, you know, if you have gain structure, you know, just coming over here and having the ability to, you know, edit, you know, the hi hats velocity. Well, it's not necessarily a gain structure, it could be like a MIDI programming function that can make kind of like a big difference overall to how it's sounding and coming across. So even if I wanted to come here and take this, you know, and do maybe like even like a little stick drag, you know, so you could do stuff like that to really change things and make the hi-hat sit better into the mix, you know, and MIDI kind of gives you a granular level where, you know, you could take each you know, each individual note and be able to kind of tweak that. So you might be able to get better results with that. So. All right, so I just see, um, are there any presets of hotkeys for cubes? Uh, for example, I like storyboard, like in Sonar, you can find a similar preset keyboard storyboard 
somewhere. Um, so I, I think, I'm not sure if it's, uh, so I, I'm not sure what the storyboard is in Sonar, or if, you're, if you're looking for hotkeys for cubes or for Cubase. Um, so if you're looking for the, like a keyboard with the different keyboard, like functions on the keys of the physical, like computer keyboard, I know that there are those available for Cubase. I think editor's keys, maybe. Um, I'm one of those like weird people that remembers a keyboard shortcut. So I don't, um, necessarily, um, have to, um, you know, constantly refer to it, but if you could let me know if it's, if you're looking for a physical keyboard, Sergo, uh, or, you know, what the storyboard function is in Sonar, I'm, you know, to see if I could find something similar. All right, so we see Michael Pierce have to kind of dash out. So um, it's about, I'm about an hour and 28 minutes into the live stream and I'm about 28 minutes behind, just as a quick uh, reference. Um, all right, so I just see Greg, uh, this is going back to the mouse. Uh, is there a reason why the Cubase EQ isn't catching, but the Fab Filter one does? Um, so I don't know, you know, why the Magic Mouse causes problems with many programs, um, but so I, I don't know, and I don't have a copy of Fab Filter um, to kind of test with. So, but I think that once you do that, and we've had people in the past on the live streams that you know. Once they switch their mouse, you know, everything mysteriously works much better for them. And so. All right, so you see Michael Teams from Weather Weatherford, Texas on the live stream. So, uh, and yes, you and Michael did miss the free, free Neve board giveaway. So maybe next time. Uh, but glad you could join us and look forward to your ice cream choices that you'll pass on to others. Okay, so just see a question. Uh, why do my exported tracks sound boxy yet sound pristine in Cubase? Uh, this is a common issue on forms and can't find an answer. I'm exporting uh, 44 kilohertz, 24 bit, same as project. Uh, any help appreciated? Um, so, you know, one of the things, you know, that can often make a difference is, um, you know, and kind of the reason that we do have a control room function is that many people would kind of use the uh, actual control room um, or they tend to use like their master fader as a um, as their monitoring volume because you know it's pretty common for people to use powered uh, speakers or powered monitors to listen to so if you you know are using this and you, you find that you're control room volume or that the master volume is kind of low but it's sounding loud um, at that point you may want to gain stage to mix where this is closer to zero and use if you have cubase pro the control room for the monitoring level so that because the, this volume control doesn't affect the gain structure of the mix uh, many times when you're doing an export uh, you know, make sure that on your master fader that you're going to have like a dithering plugin that could often make a difference. And even if your project is at the same bit depth and at the same, 
uh, sample rate, you know, when you're processing audio in Cubase, it's actually going to be processing it into 32 bit or 64 bit floating point. So if you have the option, you could also do a quick test to see if you render as a 32 bit, uh, floating point file versus a 40 versus a 24 bit fixed point, if that makes a difference for you, but you know, it should be the same, but you know, how you export it, um, you know, because even if it, the project's at 24 bit 48 or 24 bit 44.1, I think you're 44 K 24 bit, um, you know, when you're doing the processing Cubase is processing it at 32 bit or 64 bit floating point. So, uh, so on that final stage, make sure that, you know, you are applying dithering if you're not doing that or try exporting the full resolution file as well. Okay, reading through more comments. All right. All right, we see the virtual ice cream has begun. See Tim Weinheimer saying that the Apple magic mouse, magic mouse isn't so magical. See Captain Energy Music's also uh, replaces Apple Magic Mouse as well. All right, so I just saw a question earlier, um, you know, about writing a Sonata in Cubase. I think it was, saw some discussion on it. Let me just see if I could Um, just, uh, so from Sergo, I, just, I want to write an instrumental sonata at home, how to do it, you know, so, you know, you could obviously sequence it, uh, directly inside of Cubase and, you know, so many people will do that. Some people will start like, you know, from a notation and, uh, you know, traditional music background for sonatas and that's fine, but you could just come over here and play, you know, so if you wanted to take like even like a quick Schubert piece and be able to listen to it and take apart each of the individual elements. And even if you wanted to just enter it directly in the score editor. So you could definitely, you know, play the notes in uh, as you're working kind of with this, you know, um, and just play the notes in and sequence it or enter it in notation. Or if you wanted to use something like Dorico, which is more starting from the, the perspective of starting from a blank staff, but you could also do that in Cubase. Um, I tend to think, you know, that many of the composers, if they were composing now, would do it sequencing. Uh, but, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, that was the only way to really get their music preserved and written and composed was doing it notation wise.
And so, and I see from uh, thermonuclear war, just, you know, maybe he just wants to write notes in. So if you, you know, want to do that, you could come. And if you wanted to start with a blank staff, you could just come here to the score editor and be able to, you know, write notes in very easily. So you could just say, okay, as we do this, and so let's say, okay, I'll just take the triplet off and and if we're in kind of step mode, I could just go into step entry and I'll just play higher here real quick. So you could just put in notation just like that with step entry mode as well. So, so if you want to take the perspective of writing notation in, you could do that. So just see a question. Uh, I wonder how an eight track tape recorder sounds compared to this or, or is it the musicians and recording engineer? So often, you know, if you have like amazing musicians and recording engineers in a great ideal environment, an eight track recorder can work great, but you know, doing things in Cubase allows you to edit, you know, so if someone played a little bit early, a little bit late, you don't necessarily have to do that. You could record eight tracks of audio, just like you would on tape. But then at that point, you know, instead of having to, you know, purchase a mixer to mix and then effects to add the effects in, all of those different components are just a part of Cubase. And that's some of the great things of working with a DAW. So, and I worked many years on two inch 24 tracks and, you know, and, you know, while a lot of people kind of, you know, speak lovingly of them. You know, I was the assistant engineer that always had to do alignment every 90 minutes on a tape machine. So, you know, they weren't so, they weren't a lot of fun if you actually had to do all the work to maintain the tape machine and stuff as well. So. Okay, so Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, how can I put my effects and bus tracks to the right side of the mixer window? Thanks. Okay, so. Okay, so we could do it in uh, same basic concept uh, across different mixers. So let's say if I had, uh, let's say I'll add an effects track. All right, and let's say I was here and I want to add a group track to these tracks. So if I wanted to fix different elements to always be anchored to the right side of the mix console, what you could do is go to the visibility tab and then click on zone. So visibility in the upper right over here. So we will probably default to inspector, click on visibility. And then for the track in the bottom, click on zones. And then you can say, okay, I want the group and my effects channels and my stereo out to always be anchored to the right. <clears throat> and let's say I wanted the, let's say my, this is my lead vocal. I wanted that always to be anchored to the left or inputs. So you could have three zones within the mixer to kind of anchor 
tracks as well. Okay, just reading. All right, so I see um, I've been granted three scoops of extravagant, luscious chocolate swir swirl ice cream from Michael Teen. So thank you for that. It's very generous. Look forward to my ice cream flavor selection every day. Okay, um, all right, so we see a uh, thermonuclear war, maybe other people could answer this. Uh, does somebody work with master bus processing or practice clean master bus? Um, I think, and you know, I've seen this from some of my mix engineer friends that if they could get their mix sounding as good as it possibly can without master bus processing, that it tends to work out a little bit better. And I've been in the studio with like very famous mix engineers where they gotten a call from uh, the mastering engineer. It's like, oh, I think, you know, you might be able to do this one a little better. And, and they're kind of maybe cheating a little bit by mixing into the master bus processing. So I see a lot of people doing that. And I think it kind of gets you down a uh, bad rabbit hole. So, you know, I tend to personally, and others may disagree, but I try to make everything sound as great and full without master bus processing as much as you can. And then if you have to add it, you know, it'll, uh, it'll be for the improvement of the project overall. Okay, so we see, uh, please explain how to copy and paste a specific part of a track without cutting. So you could use the range tool for this. So if I wanted to just come here, I could select the range. So, and if we have this set up where we have the combo select and range tool, I'm just gonna go to the bottom. Let's say I'll just make this a little taller just so we can see it a little easier. But I will uh, just, grab this from the top here and I have the range tool and then I could just come right over here or I could say from my range and you know once we have a range selected we go to the range menu under edit and if I wanted to cut time you know so you don't necessarily have to cut I could just say okay I wanted to move that or I wanted to take this and move that range here Instead, you know, so there's stuff you could do without having to cut, copy, paste once you have the range defined. So, so experiment with the range tool. All right, um, it says, question, hi. So I don't know what I did, but 
all my sound disappeared. Uh, the recording is there. It only shows uh, the lines, but no color, like it's empty. Um, so, you know, if, you know, so I don't know if you did a recording. So if you're seeing lines or if it's maybe the amplitude was down. So if you select the event, make sure that if you go to the center of the event, I'll just kind of come here. And at that point, uh, we could just have, you know, like you may not see the event, but I'm not sure when you say when you see just the lines, but no color, like it's empty. Uh, I wonder also if there's no color, if it's muted. So maybe if you clicked on it with the X tool, so if other parts are colored, but that one is white, then maybe it's it was muted by accident. So, but if you want to email a screenshot, um, you could uh, just um, you know send a screenshot to clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, so we see Neurotic Nexus in the live stream. Um, so I just see a uh, question, will vocoders be a thing today? So Cubase doesn't have a vocoders, but you know, uh, like a built-in vocoder, there's a number of vocoder plugins that um, that could be used. Um, so, but I I don't have one on my system to show. But I see uh, someone else just asking what vocoder plugins that people are using. Uh, and I see there's a link for the TAL, T-A-L, vocoder. Okay, so we see from uh, Kerwin Young, uh, the node expression panel does not list uh, the MIDI controllers assigned to my controller. How do we solve this? I'm having a tough time figuring this out. So let me just go back to another project quickly. Glad you could join the live stream, Kerwin. Okay, so we'll come over here to the node expression. Um, all right, so let's say if I wanted to control volume. Um, so I think, um, so if this is what you're referring to. I think if you just go to the MIDI controller setup that you could add any MIDI CC from the list here. So, and then that could be um, used for drawing in. So let's say if I want it, um, let me just take a look at my controller here. See, I may have just kind of a weird CC number on this fader. I'm gonna check to see what it is. So I'll just get to my MIDI inserts.
Okay, so say I have this is controller 40, and I want it controller 40 to write in the volume here. So I'll just say input. So controller 40 isn't listed. I'll go to my MIDI controller setup. I'll say 40. We'll add that. So now I want it input from controller 40. And now, you know, or you could just do a MIDI learn. So the, the, my next one is controller 41. So at that point, kind of while we play, you know, I think that we should be able to So let's, let's get maybe a long note. I'll just draw in. So I think, you know, if you try, you know, so see if you could go into the input here, but you should be able just to do like a quick MIDI learn and see. Um, so let's say if we have this set to MIDI learn. So I'm not sure why it's, I think I had it written in before, um, but if you want to email me, Kerwin, I could, and if you have like a little project or we could see if we could get it going for you with that and you can send it to club Cubase at steinberg.de. So just see uh, from Ian, would you quantize a special orchestral performance? Um, so, you know, as someone who's played in a lot of orchestras over the years, um, you know, if it, you know, if I could quantize a lot of orchestral performances that I've been in, especially in school, I, I would. So, but, you know, if, you know, but I think, you know, overall, if we have technology, you know, it doesn't mean that we have to, you know, always use technology you know so some people say oh you know we could just you know i like the old days of working with an eight track uh you know tape recorder and that's fine and you could treat you know your computer the same way it's just a different way of capturing eight tracks of data and you could do more now you know if you wanted to you know just record a, a live performance you know, that's very easy to do. You don't have to manipulate it. So just because it's on a computer versus tape doesn't make it to, doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's, you know, you could do bad things on either ways. You know, I, have you know, talked to engineers who, you know, working on Roger Waters, uh, re, you know, records, uh, you know, like his solo records where they did what they call window edits was where they take the 24 inch tape and actually, just you know come over there and they figure out which t which track you know is on a two inch tape and they would cut physically cut out with a razor blade they would measure uh and physically cut out one track uh from a performance and take another track and physically tape you know one you know one track of the two inch tape machine on to get to something like what we could do in cubase in just a matter of seconds and that would take you know you know, days and days of working. So, you know, while, you know, people can abuse technology, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily, you, you don't have to, so.
you could be very pure in your workflows. Yeah. So if you want to work exactly like the Beatles did, you can. Um, if you want to work exactly like they did at Motown, you can. Cubase is not uh, prohibiting you to do that. It's just people choosing their workflow and with the tools that they do have available. So. All right, so we see Graham Witcher joining from the UK. Glad you could be a part of the community today. Okay, reading through comments. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, can you tell about the difference between the project logical editor and the logical editor under the MIDI menu? So, you know, how it kind of started off is we had the logical editor and the logical editor was kind of a conditional based editor. So we could take MIDI data and manipulate it. So I could say, you know, let's take every other note and raise the velocity, take every D sharp, turn it into a D natural. Um, so this kind of, and it's almost, you know, a Boolean logic. So, you know, if this, you know, if we meet these conditions, then do this. And what happened, I think this is in version eight, you know, they said, okay, we could expand this concept of not just working with MIDI data, but to work with other parts of the project. And that's when the, the project logical editor was born. So the project logical editor, you know, allows us to kind of treat elements within the project. So, you know, take all tracks that have uh, you know, these names and change it to uh, this color, you know, s take the tempo track and you divide it by two or multiply it by two. So we can see what it sounds like at half tempo. So, you know, the project logical editor is going to allow us to manipulate tracks, events, automation, tempo information, Whereas the MIDI logical editor is only going to allow us to process and apply Boolean conditions, kind of like if this, then that type of editing and manipulation uh, to MIDI data. So that's really kind of the difference between the two. Reading through comments, so thanks for all the great questions and discussions. Let me see, um, Tim mentioning that the Arturia vocoder is a great one to work with. Okay, so I just see, uh, I have a question about piano roll. How can I change the duration of a note using only the keyboard? So, um, so I don't know of a keyboard shortcut to, you know, change uh, the duration of a particular note. So let me just 
come here and just zoom in just a little bit. Um, you know, obviously you could just drag out. Um, you could go to like the logical editor if you want to say, okay, I want to take type is equal to note and change its length, multiply by two. So, and you could set up a keyboard shortcut for this if it's going to be uh, a specific, you know, so you could set up keyboard shortcuts for that if you want it to. Uh, so you could do it by various amounts, but a lot of times, uh, you know, we could, you know, a lot of like, you know, elongating events, you know, it may not be like a sp specific thing, but, you know, I think it's pretty easy to, um, you know, once you have this, you could also just adjust the length control here. So you could adjust this with your mouse. Um, so if you wanted to move the end time by measure or beat or 16th note division or just overall adjust the length, you could do that with your keyboard shortcut or through your mouse wheel as well. Yeah, so you see from Neurotic Nexus for sampling was done by cut and glue tape. So yeah. All right, so we have Danbury, Connecticut checking in. All right, still reading through uh, different discussions. Let's see Jazz Dude just mentioning about the myth about tape sounds. Uh, okay, so we had a question. Um, Just find it again. Uh, so from Best Korean Jesus, uh, I forgot how to record using mouse clicks and VSTs like Groove Agent or Retrolog. Do you mind covering that again? So I think it's in Groove Agent we could do it. I'm not sure if Retrolog will allow us to do it. But if I wanted to come here, we'll just say, um, Uh, so if we come here, we'll say, so if I wanted to record MIDI, what I would need to do is just, uh, so as I click here, I want to set the MIDI input, not from all MIDI inputs, but from uh, the groove agent. So now as I record, So 
that's all you had to do is just kind of set the actual um set the actual midi input from groove agent and then groove agent is can pass the uh different uh midi that you the notes that you hit from the mouse can then will be transmitted directly into uh the project All right, so um, we just see from uh, Graham Witcher saying, I never use any of the logical editor. I'm old fashioned recording that I do. Uh, Dom did a great video on this. I must look at these and our fantastic Cubase feature. You know, so a lot of times when I, um, you know, a lot of times when, um, you know, people get into the logical editors is when, um, you know, he, when, people get into a situation when they need them. Um, and I've probably mentioned this before in different live streams. Like I got into it when I, I was producing an album and we did MIDI drums, but live cymbals. Uh, and this is like 91, 92 ish. Um, and every time that the drummer went to his ride cymbal and hit his ride cymbal hard, it sent a false trigger on the, on the Tom pad below it. So, and this is like, you know, 45 minutes of, you know, sequences and tape, uh, and it was going to be a problem, you know, going through each Tom to figure out which one. So if you got a condition like that, I could say, you know, and the velocities are around like 45. Um, so I said, you know, anytime that there's a, this Tom and F1 sound and its velocity is less than 50, delete it. So when you come into different, you know, scenarios where you need a logical editor, knowing that it's there is, uh, is really good. All right. So you see Jeff Sabelski says, uh, Paul McCartney should opine on DAW. So yeah, he has, you know, so he actually, there's, he did an interview in Rolling Stone magazine, how much he loved running Cubase. Um, he did his whole standing stone symphony in Cubase. Um, so um, I think Paul's quote was that, you know, sometimes he's just playing with Cubase and then eight hours go by and someone has to tap him on his shoulder uh, and tell him it's, you know, time to go to bed or, you know, get dinner or something. So, yeah, Paul's been using Cubase for a long time. And one of his engineers, uh, who's done some of his recent solo records, David Kahn's also a big Cubase user. And he's been on these live streams as well. Okay, so we see how to put MIDI data in piano roll an octave up or down with a keyboard shortcut. All right, so let's say we're go into our piano roll here. So let's say I have a bunch of notes. Let me just. Okay, so all you have to do is if we have the notes selected, you could just hold down, you know, you could use the arrow keys to go up chromatically, but if you use the arrow keys with the shift key, you can go up or down by octave. So arrow up with shift, up an octave, uh, shift plus arrow down, down an octave. Okay. Uh, so we see, is there a quick way to have the chord track record the chords to the track? Um, and we just see, sorry for the questions today. You never have to apologize for asking questions. This is why we do these live streams. So an easy way of kind of doing this is let's say Just move this track right below the. All 
All right, so one way of doing it, if you wanted to get those into the, the event, is just to drag the, from the chord track directly down into the MIDI part, and that will take the chords and just populate the MIDI part. So let me know if that works for you. All right, so we see Brian Sawyer checking out. He's uh, on the road to Need to Breathe concert. So glad he could pop in real quick. All right, we see Volker saying, I want to say sorry to everyone from my school English. I'm sorry. So it's probably much better than any other language that I can't speak. So no worries. Um, I wish I could understand all the other languages, but I'm just kind of an ignorant American All right, so I see uh, Tim Weinheimer just saying, Alan Parson is an engineer in Pink Floyd's The Wall. He was talking about how much time it took to cut and tape back together to get recorded sounds for money. Yeah, so all the cash registers. Yeah, yeah. I just spoke with Alan yesterday, so he's a wonderful guy. But he didn't do The Wall. He did um, you know, Dark Side of the Moon and did the quad mix for that, which is always great as well. Okay, so we just see, uh, hi Greg, is there a way at home to produce an album in Cubase that has smooth transitions between the tracks, like Dark Side of the Moon, for instance, uh, but which recognize where the tracks start when you play the CD, so you can use a Q button to skip through tracks. Um, so we could do this in WaveLab quite easily. So if I just wanted to come here, let's go ahead and open up. WaveLab is kind of designed for this. So. And generally it's going to take like the, you know, you could have, you know, everything kind of set up, but let's say, um, let's see if I have this one project, I'll just recreate it real quick. Um, Okay, so I'll just create an empty and let's do new montage. Right. So let's say I have like my final mixes. Let me uh, let me just undo that. Let me just get a number of files in. Just look for it in here. All right, so let's say I have a number of different tracks. All right, so let's say this is kind of maybe how my montage is, and, and by default we have like a two second pause. And with this, um, we go to the CD tab um, and let's just go to like, so we'll just say, um, 
CD wizard. Uh, and let's say I wanted, so I'll just, so this will automatically put the markers in for us for the start. And really all you have to do like this song, this was set up to actually kind of segue this particular recording. So if I wanted to come here, I could say, okay, I wanted to select all of these particular clips. get my modifier key right so and at this point I can say okay let's just take all you know these clips and as you do that you could just have the transition so that when you do this this would be the start of the next song but the other song would play to here and then start to transition so it's really kind of done at the mastering stage not at the cube stage but once you kind of have the CD marker set up you could just simply kind of come directly here and have those overlap between the two so you could definitely do it and but that's going to be done kind of at the cd level you could obviously have cubase export just one contiguous audio file and put the cd markers in as well so if you wanted to put cd markers we go to the markers and at this point you could say you just wanted to insert you know uh, the particular, you know, insert CD markers uh, directly from from there. So if you wanted to just be able to do that, so we say, okay, let's insert and we'll say CD markers just around that particular frame. So you could export kind of one long continuous project, you know, one long contiguous audio file, if you will from Cubase and then just place your CD markers and then um, wh wherever you see in WaveLab and burn the CD that way. See, Michael Teams just saying, thanks, Greg, uh, for your great hangouts. We always learn something new and suspicious from you. Three cheers. All right. Okay, uh, so to see, I uh, question, I have a problem with my UR22 Mark II audio card drivers. The sound disappears for a while. Perhaps this is due to the fact that they recently installed the ASIO driver. Um, so, you know, if it's, if you're going back and forth between like your program, uh, like your DAW Cubase and, or any other, like DAW Cubase and listening to something on YouTube and going back and forth, if you go to the studio setup here, just make sure that the um, when you click on the audio system that you click on release ASIO driver or release driver when application is in the background. Make sure that that is checked. If you find that like while you're just in Cubase or while you're listening to web content like YouTube and the audio interface is just dropping out, it could mean that there is uh, on the USB port that it's connected to. So if you could connect it directly to the computer, that would be better than like an unpowered hub. Uh, but make sure that when you're connecting it, that your USB isn't set to be in like energy efficient or eco mode. A lot of times USB ports will kind of cycle down to save battery life. And if that's doing it while your audio interface is connected, you could lose audio communication with your UR22 Mark II with something like that. All right, so we see Gorn says, I like Cubase, so that's great.
So I just see Graham just mentioning Paul McCartney uses Cubase. Wow, that should be uh, that should sell this wonderful doll once and for all. So yeah, his, his son James will call me periodically as well with questions. All right, so we have <clears throat> DJ Daddy Family TV saying hello. Okay, so we just see uh, how does one start recording in 5.1? So, you know, a lot of people may have like a microphone configuration. Uh, often kind of like a Deca tree, I think a lot of people use where, you know, it could be just one set of mics that are faced in the different directions. And if you wanted to do this, we could at this point, uh, when we do like a new project, um, and if you wanted to record, you could record an audio track and you could have this uh, be configured, the configuration for 5.1. Uh, if we have a 5.1 output defined, so let's say, okay, I'll just add a new 5.1 output. And we have this track being sent to that 5.1 output. Um, we could now just double click. And at this point, you know, we could have your full 5.1 panning. You could send the mount to, you know, your LFE as well, you know, so, um, so, and all of your effects will work in 5.1 as well. So there's lots of great options that you could do uh, for just recording and mixing directly in 5.1 inside of Cubase. So. Um, so just see, I can't, in, uh, I can't install back my Cubase software. So if you let us know which version, um, uh, that you're trying to, if it's like a Cubase LE or if it's a Cubase, but you know, you should be able to go to the Steinberg download assistant and download any of the versions, uh, that, that, you know, are available. So You see a comment from Best Korean Jesus, uh, that chord thing was so simple, geez, I can show you the 10 steps I did. So I'll trust you on that, but yeah. So we try to make things easy and I'm glad that works out for you. Uh, so we see the Alan Parson project this is from Tim Weinheimer. It was a great concept, some cool songs as well. Um, so yeah, so Alan's a really wonderful guy. I always enjoy spending time with him. I haven't seen him, but I've talked to him on the phone a number of times. He's currently doing a mastering project in WaveLab. So I got to record uh, the Alan Parsons project during a NAMM show. They did a concert in Anaheim, so I got to record that. That was fun. Yeah, and he was also at the Beatles... Uh, he was, I think, the assistant engineer at the Beatles' uh, Let It Be rooftop concert. So, a little bit of trivia. You can see him in some of the pictures. A young Alan Parsons, yeah. Okay, read through some more comments. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so we see uh, from Sergo a question about the chord track using Halion. Let's say four chords, but the last chord is only played for half a measure. Maybe the first chord sounds all four bars. What's the problem? Um, all right, so let me just add a chord. I'll just add a Halion here. So now I'll add a chord track. All right, so just gonna Okay, so I see a question about uh, using the chord track in Halion, let's say four chords, but the last chord is only played for half a measure. Maybe the first chord sounds all four bars. What's the problem? All right, so let's say if I wanna come here, So let's say we'll just have this play through the monitor track. So as we play. I'll take it off the cycle. Um, so let me just see if I'm, so it seems like it's working. I'm just going to reread the question and make sure. Uh, so let's say four chords, but the last chord's only played for half a measure. Uh, maybe the first chord sounds all four bars. What's the problem? So that seems to kind of work as I would expect. Um, so just kind of you know, doing that, that's, but let me know if, uh, if I'm misunderstanding your question, Sergo. See, jazz dudes mentioning the old Nakamichi ca uh, cassette decks. Yeah, the, those are ones that people liked. So we see just a comment, uh, any tape deck is up there because tapes don't easily get erased. So there's always like my first day at the recording studio in New York, they always told us not to be the guy that ever, ever put a tape anywhere near a magnet. There's always the kind of legendary story of the lost song from Steely Dan Gaucho. Um, and one urban legend is, is that an assistant put it on a speaker and the tape got ruined that way. Other legends were that it was, uh, just someone was doing a safety copy and got the tapes mixed up. Um, and apparently there's no undo when you erase the tape, you make a safety copy the wrong way around. Okay. So we have a question. Thanks, Greg. Uh, would wave lab elements suffice to create the CD format I asked about above? So yeah, wave lab elements would do that as well. You see Michael team. So has his Yamaha MTX one four track recorder. So, All 
Harry. So we see Michael, or we see Sable Winters is just happy that she got clearance to move forward with the song, I think. I think I'm trying to figure out the emojis. I'm not so emoji savvy, but maybe it's the Beatles and Stone song. So that's great. Um, so we have a question, Greg, can you generally advise, uh, it to be more convenient to work with the core track using standard Cubase pro 11 instruments? So it's just transmitting MIDI data. So it doesn't really matter what instrument it is. So it, it will transmit the MIDI out. So whether it's, a you know, an included instrument or a, um, you know, completely different, uh, you know, or a completely different third-party instrument. I don't think that there will be any difference between the two. Okay, so we see a feature request. I hope Cubase can make group tracks flexible, able to be mono, stereo, at a push of a button. Um, so, you know, some people will just kind of, you know, put in like the down mix plugin. So let's say if I come here and I'm working with a stereo plugin. Um, so if it's going to be like for sonically, um, so, you know, if we add a group track, so let's say, okay, we'll make this a stereo group. Um, and then let's say on the inserts, you could come over here and say mix six to two. And I think that you could just do, you know, down, let's say stereo to mono. So, you, you know, there's, you know, you could ex try to experiment with that if you needed it to convert it to mono. So check out some of the down mix plugin options. Can we hear Sable's versions of Beatles and Stones? Okay, so um, let's just see a question. Uh, when I want to insert an audio loop, it shows up on the right side. When I click on it, it doesn't play for me to see what it is. The autoplay mode right there is on, but still it doesn't work. Um, so if you're auditioning the loops, let's say in the media bay here, and you're not hearing, like here we could kind of hear the drum loops. Um, so it could be that if we go, make sure you go to the audio connections. Um, so oftentimes when we come here, we could just say, if I don't have the control room activated and let's say I go to my outputs and I have this going to my control room. So sometimes that may not work until you go to the control room. So try coming over uh, and adding a control room. And if you activate that, then see if that will allow you to preview. So usually you like having a control room. So to see Volker saying he started with the Tascam 234 sync cassette in 1989 or 88. So I remember that machine. I was working with a songwriter and we were sending demos to uh, um, out to a &M Records to um, uh, his name is escaping me. Um, but the guys did U2 Rattle and Hum. So. 
but yeah, we used that. So uh, got a lot of great recordings out of that. Probably if I listened to it now, it'd be awful. So All right, so we see from uh, Square Push, uh, thanks for these great sessions, Greg, you're welcome. So I hope it's helpful. Um, so we see a uh, question, my mod wheel is malfunctioning on my MIDI keyboard. How do I exclude the mod wheel from the MIDI commands? So if you wanna filter the modulation wheels, so we see this in a lot of MIDI controllers that the mod and pitch bend wheels will, you know, maybe kind of get, start to misbehave and transmit un wanted data. So if you wanted to do that, you could go to uh, preferences. So once again, go to preferences and go to MIDI and there would be a MIDI filter section. So here you could choose to say, um, you know, you could choose to on recording, you could choose to say, okay, I want it to be controller and we'll say controller one and then at that point, you could filter out your mod wheel from being recorded or to uh, have it go through. So give that a shot right there. And also another way that you could do it on a MIDI track is to, if you go to the input transformer and you could do this globally and we could say function, we wanna choose filter and we're gonna say type is equal to controller and we need to tell what controller it is. So to say value one is equal to one. And that will allow you to filter out the modulation from ever hitting the track mm -hmm. like that as well. So a couple different ways. Um, so just see, how can you automate easy? It adds too many points when I click with my mouse, it jumps in value. Um, so I find automating a bit hard. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple different uh, approaches here. Thanks for all the great questions. And again, if you've learned something new, make sure that you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. And that allows us to continue to do these live streams as a service for the community. Okay, so let's say I have my audio track here. Um, all right, so, you know, if you're doing modulate, you know, if you're doing automation, you know, first thing you could do is, you know, if you just want it to come here, um, you could just add different points, just kind of right like that. So if you wanted to set like a static value, you know, once we have the automation lane open here, I could just come right over here and I'll just grab like, I'll select from the top and if I want to set kind of an initial value, I could just, you know, okay, that's gonna be my one value there. And then, you know, if you want it to just put in kind of, you know, different values at different times, you could say, you know, like, oh, this phrase needs to be up a little bit, just grab a range and you could do stuff like that. Or you could take a range and draw in curves like that. So if you wanna do a fade or, if we switch to our object selection tool, we could do, you know, various curves. So if you want to do your Bezier curves, you could do that stuff kind of very easily. So, you know, there's lots of ways that you can get very fast kind of just drawing in automation. You could also just, you know, say, okay, as I select my automation points here, um, you know, if I wanted to bring those all down or tilt, um, you know, and if we're just automating in, let's say I'm here and I'm just like automating the data on this particular track. So let's say, okay, I start automating and it's writing lots of data. So every time I move, it's, you know, so many points and it's hard to deal with. 
You could go to the automation uh, panel, which you could access by hitting F6. And then if you click on here and go to settings, you could also choose to do a reduction level. So you can say, okay, I want it to be 25%. Uh, and then as you look at the points, those points will be diminished every time that you do your automation reduction level. So those are a couple of ways to make automation perhaps maybe a little easier for you. Let me know if those make sense and will be helpful. Okay, so we just see uh, from Matt Elder, uh, Cubase often lags and takes a few seconds with the loading wheel before I can do anything. Uh, I'm using an i9, so that shouldn't be an issue. Doesn't happen in, in other programs. Uh, will there be a fix? Um, so um, so I, I assume that you're using the Mac from your Magic, because uh, you're using the Magic Mouse, So, but you didn't specify. Um, but, you know, usually, I mean, you could see my system is not kind of uh, processing or loading anything on, on my Mac system. So I don't think that mine is kind of, you know, doing like a little beach ball spinning thing. So maybe if there's other programs open, uh, one thing that could also be interesting is, you know, if if you notice it with all plugins or just with particular plugins, like if you start with a blank uh, project and you know you just load in a loop does it take time for that to calculate if you switch from your audio interface if you switch the buffer size raise or lower it and see if that makes a difference if you go to if you're on the Mac if you switch to built-in audio if you get the same thing then maybe it's something with your interface or buffers, but um, but generally, you know, I, I I don't think you would say say that my system. So I think it might be system, you know, systemic to your computer, but we could hopefully maybe um, find it if you could just give us a little more information. And if you have like a little video, uh, please feel free. You can share it with me at. Um, at uh, Club Cubase at Steinberg .de. All right, so we see uh, Jay's mentioning that there is gonna be a Spectral Layers Hangout tomorrow. Um, and also next Thursday, um, Lee Riley will be doing a Nuendo live stream as well. So next Thursday, I think at 4 p.m. US Eastern, so. So we see Michael Teams is saying he made many demos with his Yamaha 4-track. Yeah. Okay, so we just see uh, from Sergo, uh, Greg, maybe I'm doing something wrong in the piano roll because it happened when I transferred chord progressions to other tracks. Um, so uh, maybe Sergo, if you could just refresh because you know, I'm trying to remember the exact uh, context of the previous question. So maybe if you could uh, include that, we could probably get to it before the end of the live stream. So sorry about that. There's just a lot of questions I have to try to remember. So. 
Are you glad that Michael Pierce has been able to rejoin us? Read through comments. So. Okay, so we see uh, about the lag on the Mac. Uh, Michael Pierce is just mentioning. Um, just wondering if he had a USB external drive that he had one that took forever to wake up. So, um, so maybe, and generally the uh, Steinberg power scheme, you know, the, the Apple doesn't throttle so much the CPU like the Windows OS does. So, um, so there, it, that's why we don't see the settings on the Mac platform. But yeah, if you have a USB drive, that could uh, definitely check that out as well. Still reading through more questions here. Great discussion. So, um, so I just see Greg. What do you think of the former main Cubase rival, the former so Sonar now uh, Free Band Lab? So I think ever since it got sold from. Um, Gibson, I, I you know, I ha it hasn't really been on my radar, so I haven't really kind of checked it out in a long time. So, you know, we used to be, you know, it used to be like, you know, in the early, early days, like 92-ish that, you know, Cakewalk and, and Cubase were kind of big rivals on the PC platform. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I haven't really, since it kind of went to its new model on BandLab, it just really hasn't crossed my radar much. So I'm probably not the best person to ask, but, you know, I think that, you know, I think Cubase is a better program and we'll, we'll kind of do a lot of, um, you know, and we'll do a lot more for you. So, but I haven't really followed their new model, so. Okay, so I just see, Greg, I'm using Magic Mouse. If I change a lot of parameters by mistake, is there a way to not change values of the mouse automatically? You know, so we did have kind of discussion about this that, you know, the Magic Mouse has like weird sensitivity. So most people that have just switched to an alternate mouse don't seem to have any problems. So um, I guess you could contact Apple to see why they have problems in many programs. It's not just Cubase. Right. We see that Gareth has been able to make the live stream, so that's that's great. Thanks for joining us.
Okay, so I think I'm kind of caught up to the live uh, discussion. So I know we had some questions. I see some more coming in. Okay, so we just see a question. Uh, why was Cubase called Cubase? Um, so I think at one point they came up with the name Qubit. Uh, and I believe, uh, and I, I discussed this with uh, Bamford Rorup, who was with, he and Charlie Steinberg were the founders of the company. Um, and I think they were just about ready to go from like Pro 24, which was a sequencer, and they had developed kind of this whole new uh, like the Cubase um, concept of, you know, where we could see everything kind of linearly laid out for us. Um, and I think at the last minute, like Qubit was a video game as well. So they were just about ready to go to release. And then they just, at the last minute, they just switched it quickly to Cubase. And it's been that way for 32, 33 years. So they've done pretty well. Yeah, so I don't think the, uh, I see Jazz Dude mentioning it was Qubit before, so I don't think that the Qubit was ever released. Uh, so it was like just about ready to go into production and everything, and then just, um, here's the, see, Gareth is saying I'm Gregopedia for Cubase. That's good. All right, so let's go. Uh, to some of the questions that were uh, mailed in. So let me just go find some of those questions real quick. Okay, so I just see um, my audio was from an old four track tape. The guitar player didn't tune to a tuner or a specific key. Uh, therefore, is there a way of importing a track to a specific key, the part becoming uh, the correct key, or is it more of a workaround, i.e. like a singer slightly uh, out of key off pitch using audio warp? Uh, thanks, and it's from Steve in Manchester. So, you know, and I sent kind of a follow-up question just to clarify, but I think if you actually have just, you know, a recording on four track and a lot of times, you know, tape could some, you know, sometimes have wow and flutter and it could also at times uh, get to the point where it could record off pitch, if not a line. But let's say, uh, let me just, See if I could pull up a quick track here. Okay, let me just pull one up and we can show you. So if it's just that the guitar is out of tune and now we need to um, actually get it in tune with other instruments so that MIDI is not out of tune with that um, there's a couple of things that you could do. One is just by going into the info line. Let's get this project loaded up real quick. All right, so let's say. A... 
So, you know, really all you have to do is select the event and then you have like a transpose function. But what it sounds like is maybe the original guitar was just maybe tuned, in tune, but just sharp. And then you have a fine tune control here. So if we adjust the fine tune, we could just kind of come over here and then this will be in sense. So this will be semitones and this will, will be in sense. So if you wanted to come here and say, okay, I want it to be, you know, halfway out of tune, you know, between the pitch. So just adjust the fine tune amount. And then I bet you could also just come right over there and find kind of inhabit, you know, tune, you know, between the transpose and tune. So unless they like tune to E flat instead of E and you wanted that to be in there, you could do that. And if, you know, if that, you know, doesn't work, one of the other things that you could do is if you go here to like, even in Howling and Sonic, a lot of plugins could have a different tuning scale. So if you go to Howling and Sonic, you could say, oh, the guitar is tuned not to A is 440, but A is 452. And then you could just double click and this could change the tuning scale within uh, the MIDI instruments as well if you need it to be so that those can match the tuning of the guitar part. So, you know, I think between the transpose and the fine tuning that you could just kind of dial it in to be in tune with other tracks that you're going to record. Okay, so we had a question. Um, so I got a question for the your next live stream. I wonder if there's any chance Cubase to fill an event with the notes automatically with one shortcut or macro, uh, maybe a logical preset manager. Um, so let's say if I wanted to add an uh, instrument track here. Okay, and I wanted to just put a bunch of notes in quickly. So let's say I wanted to put in a bunch of quarter notes. Okay, so I'll come here and I want to put this on C4. So I'm going to grab my line tool here. And then if we kind of click on the line tool again, we'll see a paintbrush. So now I could just kind of draw notes in. But if I wanted to fix it to a particular pitch, I could come over here and I have my quantize value set to quarter notes. So as I would just kind of drag it in, I could drag it across and we could do that. But if I wanted to fix the pitch, I could just hold down the control or command key and then it will only allow me to draw in a single pitch. So this way I could say, okay, I just want to put it in a single pitch there so that's a pretty easy way just to kind of fill in data on different parts so uh, sorry let me know if that works where i think that should should help to fill in stuff pretty fast okay so i had a question um could you explain the most efficient way of routing for me in this simple situation? I want to record a piece of mono sound using a microphone, then mangle that sound as a sample in Halion 6. Uh, how can I route this so I can hear it, what I'm doing on the fly? Uh, I've read that you have to sidechain a Halion for this. How do I do this and why use a sidechain? Uh, also, is it more efficient to do anything in a Cubase sample editor manager such as trimming and mapping the sample to a keyboard prior to importing the sample into Halion 6. Uh, you must tell from my questions that I'm getting a bit confused about things that I know others will say is basic. Uh, hopefully you define the time to advise me and what the above of the above during the session, but no problems if I'm asking too much in one go. And this is from uh, Jonathan. So yeah, there's no, no problem at all. So, you know, it's, Sampling into uh, directly into Halion isn't necessarily kind of like a um, like like an effect that you're going to kind of mangle it. And the intention of the side chain is let me just see if it's in my recent projects here.
All right, so it's not. So I'm going to come over here. Let me just have a project just to show. Okay, so let's say I have my Halion open here. Okay, so the, iron the irony of most samplers is they don't actually sample. Um, so sometimes doing stuff quickly via sampling can make a lot of sense. So I'm gonna come over here and I'll just put this into a sample recorder and editor window. So we'll open this up. And what I want to do is tell, like let's say I want to sample from that Rhodes, this instrument, and I want to sample this in. So what I want to do is I'm going to set my record enable on both tracks. I want to activate the side chain and tell the side chain input to come from this instrument. So now what I'm going to do, and I record enable the other note, because as we do this, I could say we want to take the input source uh, and we could put this into auto next. We're gonna use the note on and note off messages. So at this point, um, and let's say I will come over here to the edit and let's go to our mapping sample. So as I hit the MIDI note, we could just choose to kind of sample directly in. So I'm gonna click on the sample icon here so as I kind of do this, we'll see. So that captures the MIDI note and adds that sample into the tree. So we could let it naturally decay out. So now I've just done a very simple, easy chromatic sampling. And, you know, I could do that just for each note. We could capture the name of the MIDI note. You know, the velocity level could be captured as well if we wanted to. And now we could just kind of come over here and if we do that into a new program, we could just do sampling that way. So that's kind of why we have the side chain capability just to kind of simplify the process. So, you know, if I wanted to take a track, you know, like my microphone and drop it in, we could take any voice file that we want as well. So let's say if I wanted to do just a quick uh, new program and I have, you know, so I'll say let's do, um, You know, so I wanted to come over here to, let's say I have, and I wanted that, I could just drag and drop the sample. And we could have this playback, you know, reverse or one shot, so. So at that point, we could do kind of more manipulation here. And the editing that we could do here could be more kind of like for start and end times. But, you know, so you could just drag and drop right into Halion. Or, you know, if you want to do it using kind of the built-in tools that are included, you could say, okay, I want to take this me. and drop it into the sampler control. And now I could just play, you know, this particular sample. Me. 
And so you could do your different manipulation here of your sampler and say, okay, I want to put this into uh, audio warp mode. And so now I could. And sorry for hitting my mic and be able to kind of manipulate it. And okay, at this point I want to take, you know, say, okay, I want to run this through a filter. So I wanted to be able to take, you know, and then you could also go into having your LFOs to change sounds as well. So if you wanted to be able to do lots of different types of editing and manipulation, but really the side chaining is for more sampling particular instruments. Okay, so we see a question. Uh, how can I draw in a glide or slide MIDI notes in a key editor? So a lot of times when we're doing uh, MIDI editing, and this could really depend upon if the instrument or the patch is supporting it, but a lot of times what it's gonna be is just portamento. So if you just kind of come over here, um, let's see if it's gonna be listed as one of the main controllers. So, um, so it, I'm trying to remember what CC message it is, but you could um, just come over here and just have portamento. But a lot of times as people do it, it could be more of a function of the particular instrument. So let's say if I wanted to go here uh, and do kind of glide type editing. So let's say, um, so I could place this into a monophonic mode so that, and when we do this, uh, you know, we could, you know, as we come over here, we go to pitch and we could choose to just have the, a glide time. And this will be just like a function of the instrument. So when I hold down one note, that it will. So if I want that to be slower, I could say. And let's say it's probably too slow for the sample. So let's say, you know, so you'll be able to do and set that glide. So it's not really something that's drawn in. Sometimes it will be drawn in as being portamento is often the MIDI message, but a lot of times it's more the instrument itself that's doing it than, uh, than a MIDI message, but it's just kind of the design of how the instrument is responding. Okay. Okay, so we had a question. Um, how do I change the selection color of a track, uh, the default white? Um, I will attach a screenshot. Uh, when you select a track, part of it will turn white. Um, I would like this to be another color. I use Cubase 11 Pro. So when we, I think his question is like when we see the track selection here to indicate that this is selected. So I don't think that this is changeable. Uh, but let's take a look at the preferences. I think that might be kind of like a universal, just a pretty obvious indication that, that is uh, selected. So let's see if I, maybe we'll just come over here and say if I change this, hit okay and apply. So I just set the focused color. So it's still kind of white. Let me just. Yeah, so I think that that color selection will be fixed. I thought maybe the focus color might do it, um, but I don't think so. So I don't know if there's a way to change that, but I think it's pretty, um, like that's a pretty easy way to see what different elements are actually selected in the project. So I, I think that's a pretty, 
uh, a pretty good color choice, but I, I will mention that to the teams and pass it along as feedback. All right, let me jump back to our live questions. As I see we're one like away from 100 likes, so if we could maybe hit 100 likes, that would be great. Make my boss happy, all right. All right, let me scroll back in time and get back to where I left off in the discussion. Uh, so we see any word on the Cubase 12 release? So nothing that I could share at this point, but so we'll have to, we'll have to just kind of be patient, I guess. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, any tricks with audio routing for sound design purposes? Uh, sending, splitting audio for processing, grouping. Um, I find uh, I find it a bit time consuming. Is there a flexible way for this? So, you know, sometimes you could treat some of the plugins like if you want to do like particular processing. I'll just show you kind of an example here. Let me see if I can find it quickly. You know, but you know, there's a lot of creative stuff that you could do. So let's say, you know, I have a loop. Um, and like, you know, we had someone that wanted to do like uh, a reverb, um, but they didn't want, you know, and they had a loop, but they didn't want like the kick to be in the reverb. So, you know, what we did is place an imager plugin. So, you know, if you wanted to kind of divide the frequency range. So now I could just have, and I could just solo particular frequencies. So now we could have like all of the frequencies of the particular drum here playing back. Uh, but if I wanted the reverb to only be on that particular uh, effect, like uh, I don't want it to be on the bass, I could just choose to, you know, solo just like that one band so we could have the kick. And then, you know, as we come here, we could have, you know, a lot of reverb just on the hi-hat and snare without applying it to the you know without applying it directly to all of the frequencies where that could sound really kind of flop a bit floppy so i just wanted to get rid of the kick reverb so being able to kind of divide frequencies you could do this quite effectively using the imager plugin so if you kind of play around with that and you could also just say you know I wanted the reverb to only, you know, if we change the order of this, you know, we could say now the reverb is only in, gonna be processed through these frequencies. So we could kind of mask different reverb. So if you're doing a lot of stuff for um, sound design, that's, you know, pretty great for that, you know, and I think one of the best sound design tools that you could actually have is one of the instruments that's included. If you start messing around with pad chop, you know, you could do all sorts of pretty amazing things. So let's say we add an instrument track, uh, not an audio track, but let's say an instrument track and let's make this into pad chop. And what Pad Shop will allow you to do is you could basically load samples right into it. And it's a granular synthesizer. So let's say, okay, I wanted to come over here and just find a loop. Let's say a vocal loop. A mute. So I could drag that over. And at this point, we could just, you know, take a, an existing. And I wanted to take this vocal file. So that's that same vocal file.
So you can come up with like really, you could spend, you know, weeks. And, you know, if you check out some of, uh, on the Steinberg uh, VST Instruments channel, you can check out some of Gary Gibbons videos on this. Uh, he's like a master at it and has all sorts of amazing content for that. But being able to just kind of take any audio file in there or be able to route through uh, specific frequency ranges is really a great tool using the Imager plugin. All right. All right, so we see Lola Garrett's daughter is checking in. She says hi, so give her our best. We hope school's treating her well this year and hope that you're getting getting pizza on your Friday night. So All right, so I just see uh, I have a latency issue when I'm using the pitch corrector plugin, how to correct it. So if, you are, if you're using it in real time, realize that some plugins will impose latency. So let's say if I wanted to um, come over here to my mix console and on this particular track, you know, some plugins will be, you know, more intensive and could impose more delay. So let's say if I put the pitch correct plugin on we can see that's going to be about 40 milliseconds of delay um, so that's the processing time for the pitch correct plugin so if you're doing it in real time that's when you'd hear the uh the delay so as you're recording in real time so if you have the option to record the track and then process it through the pitch correct plugin afterwards once the audio is in, then the plugin will allow you to process it and will be delay compensated so that as you're doing all of the processing, you know, it'll, you know, if it says this plugin takes 40 milliseconds to do its magic, at that point, it will play the track 40 milliseconds earlier so everything is in time. So you may have delays and it's just kind of a, you know, that silly physics thing. Uh, but, you know, if you have the option to not do it in real time and do it after the delay, the processing delay of the plugins will be compensated for and it won't be an issue for you. Okay, just reading through comments. Okay, so I just see uh, from Lars, um, let me see if I could get maybe the first part of the question. Um, okay, so, okay, I think we covered that already. I think it's maybe a track presets for uh, sound design. Okay, so uh, we have a question from Gareth. Um, could you demonstrate some nice ways of setting up uh, punch in and out versus the locators and setting up pre-roll and loop record options? All right. All right, so let's say if I wanted to do a uh, punch-in. Now, generally, punch-ins can be um, set up to be tied to the left and right locators. So let's say if I have this as a loop, I could come over here and let's say, uh, and we could have this decoupled from the cycle. So let's say I'm gonna hit I and O, or just to the left of the transport, we can activate punch in and punch out. So now as we play, we'll see on this particular audio track that it will record and then punch in and punch out. 
So we could do that. Now, if I wanted it to punch in and punch out and just do a cycle record, let's say I will now just click here and activate my punch in, punch out, and it will just continue to do a cycle recording when it gets to the end instead of punching out. And then we could have it punch out, you know, as soon as we hit stop, that's when the record enables. Now your punch in and punch out may still be active. So you could be aware of that. Um, and I think that there may be a preference for that. So let's say if we go to, um, to audio, to recording, to audio, um, so you could say, you know, deactivate punch in on stop or stop, uh, stop after automatic punch out. So if you wanted to have that set up, so let's say I have this set up and I wanted to do a punch in again. So as we do this, we have our punch in activated. So we go to record and it goes out of record and you could have it stop right at that particular point. Now, sometimes you may want to just do, to give maybe a little bit of a reference, like a couple, like a measure before for the musicians and a measure before after. And you want this to loop, but you only want to punch, let's say a specific portion of the audio. So what we could do is grab the range selection tool. And I will say, let's take this range and I have a preference activated. Let me just show you that where you can say cycle follows range selection. So let's say I don't want that. Okay, so let's say, you know, we need to give a little bit of context kind of before and after. So at this point we go to the transport, we could activate something called punch points. And what punch points are is independent punch in and punch outs based on the range selection. So I'm gonna say set punch points and we go again, go to transport to punch points and we'll say set punch points to selection range. And when this is when we see these little red. So now I'll go back to the beginning and we can say, okay, we'll punch in and we could punch out. So let me just activate those punch preferences again. So under record. Doo -doo -doo. So just for demonstration purposes. So if we wanted like a bit of pre and post roll, I could just kind of hit, let's say, okay, I'll just set my range here again. So we'll say, uh, so again, transport, to punch points, set punch points to location range. So now we'll punch. So we punch in, punch out. So if let's say I wanted to now put this into cycle. So if I wanted to have different takes, I could just come here, punch in, punch out, and have it loop back and punch in, punch out. So that's a pretty easy way to do it. Now you could also activate kind of pre-roll. So you could have a count in. So we see this right on the transport bar. And if you don't see it, you might have to just kind of uh, elongate this a little bit, but that's what this icon is. So like if you say, okay, I'm here and I just want to start recording at this point. So say I'll just turn off my punch in, punch out that we could have it do a pre-roll uh, so that it will just kind of jump uh, directly back. So let's say if I take this off and okay, I want to go to measure 21-ish and I hit record. So that way you could set it up to be like a one or two measure kind of count in. So I think using the punch points, you know, so kind of decouples the punch in punch out from the left and right locator. So the, that left and le right locator range can be set independently, which is really handy.
Okay, read through more comments here. See, Michael Pierce this is a great comment. My son made this point trying to figure out horse powers, and, he, and Michael just says, I love that things are still measured in horses. So, trying to explain how my son's uh, little motor he got from Amazon was more powerful than a horse. Yeah. All right, we see David M is joining us on a camping trip. So. And we see Mandy Lane's also joined. Um, so you just see, is it possible to quantize audio inside a sampler track? I don't think so, but let's give it a shot. Um, It's the wrong window. So, you know, let's say if we come over here, let's go to, you know, so I don't think we could really necessarily quantize, but if we come over here, let's say if we do slices and we drag the slice out, Mandy. So let's say if I drag this um, so we could play back kind of this same exact sample set. And then once it's kind of because we kind of sliced this and dropped it in, at this point we could take uh, this and, you know, quantize to, you know, make horrible results like that. Or if you wanted to say, okay, let's just grab and quantize this to eighth notes so you could quantize to or you know eighth note triplets you could then quantize so while it's not necessarily in the sampler track the sampler track can slice it and then once it's in the midi domain you could quantize All right, so Jazz Dude was kind enough. So CC65, I'll remember that for next time, is the Portamento controller message. So you see Michael Pierce saying, uh, the glide function of the sampler track is something I didn't know existed, uh, revelation of the day. So what's really cool is, especially with the sampler track, um, is doing the glide function. Um, so you could do stuff like that, but also if you wanted to do for uh, like pitch shifting, you know, like if you have someone that's like writing a song, um, like I had my friend Daryl Pearson who's done all sorts of amazing R&B work, but um, so I had him just actually just, you know, play. So he has just saying one note with like a particular rhythm. He needs accomplished with this program. This is a recording. 
So as I do this, I can now put this in monophonic mode and also just kind of put it in legato mode. And I'm gonna just gonna hold the first key down and I could just play kind of a melody. And instead of it re, you know, instead of it playing. So if I turn this off every time, it would start to sample at the beginning. But if I turn this on, I could just. Sing this phrase for Greg so that he can get what he needs accomplished with this program. This is a recording. So I could take just any audio and just repitch it like that, just from MIDI. So if you have a singer and their songwriting is like, oh, and they want to try and experiment different ideas, just have them sing one pitch, and then you could repitch the audio in the sampler track too. Okay, so we just see, uh, how do I split the audio signal for different processing without sending it? For example, mono bass. Um, I want to be in mono, but I want to route it to another audio channel for processing. So let's say uh, if I wanted to take, uh, you know, this particular. So if you come, just as we kind of showed before, so let's say if you go to the um, imager, so I think it'll be under spatial and panner. And then we could just have, you know, one particular band. So you could actually just, uh, we'll make it two bands here just so we could split. And then instead of this being kind of wide, you could just have that be mono as well. So each band, you could adjust the stereo width. So if you want it like the sound of the low end to be very mono, just simply put it in uh, the imager plugin, and then you could just have the low end uh, be just you know completely kind of mono, so that all the stereo information on the left and right side could be just um, you know almost ignored. So. So we see Sergo Casimir just mentioning, uh, by the way, yesterday I spent two hours trying to choose the tone of paint for Cubase. It always makes your mix sound better. So, but yeah, we have lots of people. I know many engineers will sit there like when the artist is trying to get a take. Uh, I remember being in Nashville once and two very prominent engineers and very different genres, but you know, and they were both like their little mental vacation was, you know, changing the metering colors while the, you know, the musicians are trying to get their performances down, so. All right, so we see from uh, David KO65, how do I tell my band leader I'm having too much fun learning Cubase and don't want to, don't want to do a real gig next week, so. That's good, all right. All right, we see Gareth is having to to leave a little bit early for some prep work. So thanks for joining us, Gareth. Glad you could join and be a part of the community. All right, we see Michael Pierce is going to the pub for a meeting, so pretty late for a meeting in a pub, but we'll let you go. But thanks for joining.
just reading through comments. All right, so we see Bob joining us. So just see a comment. Uh, I would like to see in Cubase the ability to change the width and size of icons to fit the monitor standards. However, Sonar proved to be very informative due to its large, cumbersome interface. So, you know, there's always a balance of, you know, trying to, you know, fit. And it's kind of a never-ending ba battle of, you know, trying to give you as much information, you know, with as much iconography as possible and realize that, you know, different icons can mean different things in different countries. So it could be, uh, it's a bit of a daunting task, but I think, you know, the balance of Cubase is, you know, default state and like, you know, I enjoy running it at like a 1080p resolution, but you could increase that and, you know, pick and choose different components that you want to see active and load it. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a good balance, but and you know, you could always try the different uh, scaling resolutions depending on your, uh, you know, on your if you're running like a 4K setup, so. All right, we see Cubase Junkies joined. Thanks for getting in and joining the community for the live stream. All right, so we just see, uh, hi Greg, uh, what is the best way to have zero latency monitoring of eight external MIDI instruments playing back MIDI notes from Cubase? Uh, I've given up on USB MIDI devices, uh, maybe using Steinberg AXR. So, you know, the AXR does have MIDI in it, um, you know, but sometimes, you know, I, I was talking, I forgot, what, you know, what film composer I was talking with recently, uh, but, you know, we're just, you know, I think it was Trevor Morris just kind of made a comment uh, when I was talking to him last of, you know, how, you know, like the, we've gotten kind of used to like really tight MIDI timing with, you know, with VSTs because they're sample accurate for the MIDI playback. And, you know, and he was just kind of made a, an off the cuff comment last time we were speaking about, you know, oh, you know, how MIDI was like, you know, traditional outboard MIDI was always like 10 to 20 milliseconds, but if it was all 10 to 20 milliseconds out, then it seemed tighter, but there were always kind of fluctuations. Um, and I think we discussed this before, and it's great to see you back on the live stream, but, um, you know, I know, like last time I was at BT Studio, uh, he had the iConnectivity interfaces which i think run and i think we may have discussed this but just in case i didn't but that's what he was using for his cubase rig um for all of the uh you know and he has you know a plethora of outboard gear so um you know and he seemed to you know really like the how they worked and the timing of them so i don't know if you've had a chance to maybe try one of those out um You see Graham Witcher likes the punch in, punch out.
Okay, so we see from uh, Jeff Sabelski. Um, so it says, Greg, using uh, bounce left and right and using effects tracks like Reverb, the Howlian Sonic has master volume, mix volume, separate balance options too for mixing left and right. Tracks hard to maintain exact control. Okay. So let me see if I could uh, figure out Jeff's question here real quick. Okay, so All right, so it says um, Greg using balance left and right and using effects, um, using effects tracks like Reverb, the Howlian Sonic SE has master volume, mixed volume, and separate balance options too. Mixing left and right tracks, hard to maintain exact control. Um, so, you know, if you want it to, yeah. You know, so, you know, you're gonna have, you know, so I'm not sure if I understand a question, unfortunately, Jeff. So, but, you know, you could have, so let's say if we have our effects in, so let's say, okay, I have a, a reverb and a delay and let's say a chorusing on here. So when we do the vibraphone, we can now go to the mixer and we could have, you know, our, now our delay and let's say our chorusing. So, um, but I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I'm just having a brain cramp, Jeff, but um, so mixing left to right on tracks is hard to maintain exact control. You know, so you're gonna have the panning here and if you're using internal effects, you could do that. But uh, one other thing is if, let's say if we're in the track edit window you know, something that a lot of people miss. Let's, so let's say if, if we add a send here, so let's say we'll add maybe a flange or something obvious here. So as we would, you know, but you could also check out kind of the panning of you know the individual effects tracks as well but you know i have a feeling i'm not kind of getting to your point that you want it so all right sorry about that all right so we see lawrence coke who's checking in from the from the car heading home from his day job i'm glad you could make the part of the live stream Okay, so we have a question. Uh, is it possible to make change of effects and save them in separate sets with cleansed settings and graphic visualization? So, um, you know, you could save like track presets. So let's say, okay, I have an audio file here and let's say we go to media to presets and we'll see track presets and we'll say audio and let's say, okay, I want this for, so let's say on this track, I have my inserts open or I'll just open up the channel. And then if we just drag, let me just, I think we could even just um, drag. If we drag these like to the, the track itself, we could see everything. So once we have this open, I could just drag these, you know, to the track like this and replace kind of all the different track settings. So, you know, as we drag, I could just come right there where we see kind of a green line show up in the middle. I could just say, and that will automatically kind of just update 
uh, that particular track right there. So you could have, you know, any number of track settings. And once you save a track preset, you could just right click on a track and save the track preset. And that will include all the EQs, the channel strips and inserts, volume and panning. See, Dryath just made it 112, probably on the likes. Thank you for that. And this is a great comment from uh, Jeff Sabelski. After I saw the colors in Cubase, I repainted my bathroom. So. All right, so we see two revelations for John Costigan today, the uh, punch in, punch out cycle independence, the punch points and the imager monoizing of low end. Um, so you just see, can a preference be added to swap the color of the mute and solo buttons? The majority of control surfaces and DAWs have red for mute. And amber for solo. Most consoles I know, it's you know the solo is like you know the red light. So um, I'll mention it, but I, I'm you know I think that's a pretty long-standing audio uh, you know standard. I know some other programs and control services may not work that way, but you know a lot of them do. All right, so I think I'm at the end of the questions. I'll wait just uh, another minute or so, but we'll see if there's any other questions. If not, we could wrap up a couple minutes early, get everyone's weekend started a little bit. Uh, so once again, um, I saw mentioned that there's gonna be, I think there's a Spectral Layers live stream tomorrow. Next Thursday, there will be a Nuendo live stream from Lee Riley, so check that out. And I'll be kind of more post game audio sound design. Um, and uh, look for our next live stream to be on Tuesday and Friday of next week, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. Um, so, but we'll just give it a couple more seconds. If not, we'll wrap up just a little bit early. Uh, I want to thank everyone for the wonderful questions. I hope that everyone has learned a new tip or trick and gotten a revelation of their day. And we will, um, you know, Look forward to uh, doing this again on Tuesday. And if you have questions that you want to submit in advance, please send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. We'll wait just another minute or so. I know that there's a delay often when I'm speaking to when you guys hear. Okay, so with that, I guess we'll wrap up just a couple minutes early. Uh, thanks everyone for the great questions and a wonderful live stream and we'll see everyone on Tuesday.